on this episode of the Oklahoma Breakdown with Iker and Layman, presented by Riverwind Casino. We bring you the latest OU football news. And in football, guys talking softball, we talk about the national champions. They did it again, people. We finish up giving you our winners and losers of the weekend. Please download and subscribe to the podcast, rate it five stars, and write us a good review. Follow the show on Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, and YouTube. Just search Oklahoma Breakdown on any of those, and you'll find us. All right. Our man, Michael Hostie, will kick this thing off. It's time for the Oklahoma Breakdown. It's a beautiful Monday, June 13th, and you're listening to the Oklahoma Breakdown with Hiker and Layman, presented by Riverwind Casino. Riverwind is Oklahoma City's premier casino experience, and there are so many reasons why Riverwind is consistently voted OKC's number one casino, but it all starts with their amazing variety of gaming thrills and excitement. Riverwind's beautiful award-winning environment plays host to more than 2,800 of the latest electronic games with a huge selection of table games, including blackjack, blackjack match, roulette, and Teddy's favorite, craps. No matter what your game, Riverwind has it in spades and hearts, and the Beats and Bites Festival is rolling, people. Everclear with Sister Hazel and Deep Blue Something will be performing June 18th. It's $5 general admission, and kids under 12 get in free. Ton of food trucks, all kinds of things for the kids to do, including face painting and an inflatable obstacle course. To buy tickets, visit riverwind.com. Riverwind Casino, simply the best. Now, recording this Sunday night, please leave us a five star review and a nice comment while you're at it. Do we remember how to do this? It's been a I while. Don't know. Dude. Is this mic on? Can you hear me okay? Are we, are I, we live? Is this, is this how it works? We now do. We haven't done one live in a while, but we have not missed an episode. So I'm very proud of us. So I, I guess we start with you took your son to Disney. Yeah. How, how was that? Uh, how long do we have here? Let me just say this. My son had a great time. He was fantastic. Um, there's some cool things about Disney. And there's a lot of things that I hate about Disney. Um, Money-wise, that, that's the biggest thing. It is, it, it's just an absolute beatdown for however long you're there money-wise. Gabe, we're talking about lunches where my son had buttered noodles. I had a hamburger. My wife had, like, chicken tenders. $250. What? Yeah. Yes. Mickey Mouse is out, out there ripping people off. Is that what you're telling me? Yes. Let me just tell you something. And, and it's not just Disney World. It's everywhere we, you know, traveling down, traveling back. It's a, it's a constant beat down, a constant scam. I'm telling you, this consumer, done. I'm not buying anything. I'm not spending money on anything unless it's an absolute necessity. I've tapped out. I quit. <laughs> Look, I hope Disney World, Disney World, Disneyland, Disney World. World, yeah. I, I hope Disney World is happy. You, you broke, Ted. Look yep. at what you did. Broken, which I knew, I knew it was going to happen before it all started, but I will say there was some fun stuff, no doubt. We had a blast. My son was fantastic the whole time he was there. It was, it was cool. Good memories. Well, I'm glad you got some good memories to go I along. Him, said, I hope you enjoyed it, buddy. Never happening again. <laughs> well, <laughs> I, I could, I can now use that to push off a trip to Disney world as long as I can now with my wife. And once again, my son's about to turn a year old here in about a week. So I am, I'll tell him hey, I'll take him when he's 18. I, my son is seven. And I think that was, I think that's the perfect age. He still enjoys all the characters. He's old enough to do all of the rides, all of the roller coasters, everything. You don't have to push him around in a stroller or carry him. He can weather the heat and, and, and stand in line and entertain himself when he needs to. I <laughs> trust me, man. I saw people there with kids that were like three years old and no way. Seven to me is the perfect age. Seven. All right, that 
Start I, saving I, now. I will I will start saving now <laughs> and I will take him when he is seven and that is established. Okay, man, we got a lot to talk about, so we better get to it. Let, let's start with what we always start with, some OU football stuff. And, and want to start here, Ted, three OU guys on the College Football Hall of Fame ballot, which a list of about 80 that came out this year. I, I, will, I will not go into my giant complaining, winding rant about you not being on there. I will, I will save you that because I know you don't like when I do that, but it is ridiculous that you haven't even been on the ballot up to this point. I will just leave it at that. But Rocky Kalmus, a guy that you were clearly very close to at OU, uh, being on that national championship team with him in 2000, two-time consensus All-American, Big 12 Defensive Player of the Year, won the butt kiss, he was, I mean, he was that dude. Really cool to see Rocky on the ballot. Nope, totally deserving. Absolute beast. Um, you know, won everything that you can win. Uh, was just totally, totally uh, a, a massive factor in why OU won national championship. Why OU was able to pull the turnaround that they did so quickly. Um it, it, I can say that I never would have accomplished anything if I wasn't there and able to play with Rocky and when I was younger, watch him play and how he prepared, how he practiced, how he carried himself, how uh, he held everyone else accountable. It's, it's way easier. And I, I, you you probably can talk about this too because of the list of of great centers that we've had in a row. It's so much easier to watch someone great do it and kind of lay down the groundwork of the foundation on on what it takes and then just try and follow suit. Way easier to do it that way than to be uh, the trailblazer. And I I think uh, Rocky was the trailblazer. Yeah. And that is like, like you said, that's, that's difficult to do, but just, I have all the respect in the world for him because of how you talk about him. Right. I, and you are, you're, you're one of the ultimate team guys that I've ever been around. And just the, the things you've told me about Rocky, uh, just kind of how he led that team and kind of dragged some other guys with him along the way. He, it, it, I wish, I wish voters and people that are responsible for, for the, you know, the hall of fame and stuff like they, they knew more of that stuff because that, that is really what matters. Like true leadership, right? Yeah. I, I think that's hard to, it's hard to look at a list of accomplishments and understand what Rocky Kalmus meant to OU football in, just in that leadership role that he had for that defense in, in that team. Yeah, he he was so instrumental in in those early defenses. That that 2000 defense was was unbelievable. Um obviously the 01 defense his senior year was was really really good. But, you know, a lot of it started with him. He made the calls, he made the checks. Um he got everyone lined up. He set the front. Uh he knew it, you know, forward, backwards. He was the guy that, you know, he wasn't the loudest. He, he, he wasn't. A, well, I mean, he talked some trash on the field. He, he did. He was a trash talker. I mean, I mean he's from jinx. I mean, come on. Yeah, yeah, he, he, he got a little something to him, but he wasn't like the, he wasn't a talker when it comes to his leading style. He was more of a, you know, set the example. Everyone knows that he's always going to do everything that he's supposed to. He's the guy you look to for answers. Um, and you know, he'll, He'll pull the teeth out whenever he needs to, but dude was an absolute beast all around linebacker. Amazing. Made more plays just always around the football, right? And you, you look at it and schematically the way a play unfolds, it's like he's not supposed to make the play, but somehow, you know, he's able to to find a way 
two gaps over to clip a guy's leg for a tackle for loss on a third and one, you know, whenever you have to have it. He's, he's amazing. Yeah. Not only that, like, I don't think people remember j- just because, you know, some of the big plays he made, he was really good. And remember this is early 2000, right? He was really good in coverage to like right. always tipping balls, always in passing lanes, you know, to some of his more famous plays or interceptions. Right. But he was, like you said, he was always around the football and everyone also still gets you two mixed up, which is the best part about it. <laughs> Nonstop. And I've joked about it enough on my radio show that now I can't tell if someone is just playing along with the, the joke on the radio show or if they're serious and usually they're serious, but um, I do have to say another thing about him. Not only was he a great leader, great player, great role model for everyone to, to follow. Dude was tough as hell. Always had at least one cast on his body while he was playing. Uh, broken wrist, thumbs torn up. Uh, he, played, he played like the back half of uh, the 99 season with a broken leg. <laughs> he had a broken bone in his leg. It's just, dude, it was incredibly tough. Yeah, so I think that was our our long-winded way of saying, yeah, he should be in the College Football Hall of Fame. Now, no we're going to say that about all these guys, right? Because they're OU guys and we're OU guys, but he was he was that dude, man, for one of the historically great defenses in college football history. Okay, this is this is the time of year where – we remind everyone that Josh Heupel was a hell of a football player. And then you talk about how stupid it is that he's not already in the college football hall of fame. Just a reminder, consensus, all American AP player of the year, Walter camp player of the year, sporting news player of the year, CBS sports player of the year, big 12 player of the year, and probably should have won the Heisman trophy. Yep. No big deal. Just took a, um, a, a, a team that had turned completely backwards, uh, several losing seasons in a row and took them to first winning season in a while and then won the national championship in his second year. He had two years at OU and was able to fully turn a team from a losing program into a national champion, did it with leadership, um, you know, started a a really a, a revolution for the big 12 and for OU offensively, just an unbelievable player. Should have won the Heisman Trophy, in my opinion. You know, statistically, you look back at some of the statistics and things have massively changed, but um, didn't blow you away. But some of the plays that he made whenever he had to, some of the throws, like some of these didn't have the biggest arm, but, you know, threw some of these deep balls so early and so high and let guys run under him. Just beautiful, beautiful um, you know, just playmaking ability. And he's way more athletic than people give him credit for. Ran the ball really well, several rushing touchdowns. Uh, did a good job getting outside of the pocket. Absolutely should be in. And is still a big part of the game today. This is, I, I think Josh Heupel is the perfect example of the way your NFL career goes mattering too much when it comes to the College Football Hall of Fame. It shouldn't matter. Like, I understand that it's it's impossible not to factor it in a little bit, but this is how, how I've always looked at Hypo's situation and why he should be in. You think about that season. If you were the face of an entire season of college football, if you were the first person that everyone thinks about when you're talking about a complete season of college football, you should be in the College Football Hall of Fame. He was the face of that team that won a national championship. So when you think of that season, the first person you think of is Josh Heupel. He should be in the college football hall of fame. That should automatically get you in like that. If you were the face of a season in its entirety, you should just, they should just say, Hey, here you go. You're in. Yeah, I, I totally agree. And I think it's cool that he's still, very relevant in the game today. Obviously, uh, won some big-time games at OU as the offensive coordinator. 
um, did some good stuff as head coach at, at Central Florida, and now here he is uh, already doing some really good things at Tennessee, and they're poised to have a really nice year. Uh, the, guy, the guy means a ton to college football. I have all the respect in the world for him as a football player and was just lucky to be there and watch him work. Yeah. Last guy that is on the ballot for the College Football Hall of Fame, Dewey Selman. I, I'm not going to lie. The guy's a four-time Big 8 champ. He's a two-time national champion. I thought he was already in. I thought all the Selman brothers were in. I'm not going to lie. I, when I saw this, I was like, wait, really? The guy that had the 22-tackle game against Texas in, what was that, 74? He's not in? The, the defensive tackle that racked up a couple of hundred tackle seasons. It, I think he had like 123 tackles in 1975 Crazy. at defensive tackle. It's an absurd statistic. I, I, I can't be the only one that thought all the Selman brothers were already in, right? Uh, no, I think that's probably unanimous. Um, and I, hopefully that's everyone voting's reaction. Whenever, whenever they, they, they come across it. They just look at the ballot. They're like, wait. Wait, what? Man, One of the Selmans is it in? Those those teams, those 74-75 national champion teams, the defense is just unbelievable across the board. Every single player is amazing. And um, I've got no doubt that he's going to make it in for sure. Yeah. Okay. Next big item here for OU football. It is. It's officially official. We've talked a lot about it, but UCF, Cincinnati, and Houston have come to a buyout agreement with the American Athletic Conference. They will each pay $18 million in order to make the move to the Big 12 starting in 2023. So with BYU already announcing they will do the same, the Big 12 will have 14 teams in 2023 and 2024 if OU and Texas stick around through the length of that contract. So we'll see. I, I feel very comfortable saying we will at least get one season of a 14-team Big 12 conference. Now, two seasons, I, I, I don't know, because maybe OU and Texas do something very similar to what we're seeing UCF and Cincinnati and Houston do right here with this buyout with the Big 12 and making that move to the SEC a year early, I don't know. I still, I still believe taking your sweet time is the best course of action, but it is, it's good to know that this has all been worked out, and we're going to get a little shakeup here in 2023. Start next season should be fun, man. I love it. I'm, I'm anxious to see how it looks, um, see what the schedule looks like. You know, we've talked about it. UCF, Cincinnati, and BYU, three destinations that I definitely would like to go go see. Uh, Houston, eh, not so much, but, uh, you know, I doubt that in those two years that we'll, we'll play on the road at all of those places, but we'll see what happens. Um, I think it's a great time for all four of those programs to join the Big 12. I think they're all totally competitive right now. Uh, we'll see if Cincinnati – I doubt they'll be to the level they were last year, but they're still going to be really good program. They've recruited well. They're coached really well. Uh, same thing with UCF, Houston, obviously, and BYU. So I think it's going to be good additions. They're going to be competitive. There, No one in the Big 12 really, aside from OU, maybe Oklahoma State and Baylor, can turn their nose up at any of these teams. I mean, they are, they're going to be right there in the pack competing. Yeah, especially, you know, with, with the way that Fickle's got things rolling there in Cincinnati, I'd be, I'd be really, really surprised. I don't think Cincinnati's going to be like West Virginia, right, where, where they get in the conference and struggle. I yeah. just, I don't, I don't think that's going to happen. I, I think that the way that he's built that, that program, well, they have nine draft picks. Yeah. Something like that. It, he's That's going to be the biggest problem is how are they going to be, how are they going to rebuild? And I, I don't expect him to fall off, but when you lose your quarterback, a couple of really good corners, a bunch of other players thrown in there, it's going to be difficult, but they've, they've found guys. They've, they've been solid for several years now. 
Yeah. And they've, they've found some really good players from the portal also, right? Yeah. Guys leaving SEC schools, stuff like that. So we'll see. But I, I did think the, the details of the buyout were interesting, right? The original buyout, $10 million. The extra $8 million will be paid over a 12-year period starting in 2025. It, it's like Kyle Singler's contract back in the day. Just stretch it, Ted. Just stretch it. I, stretch and wave. Wave and stre- let it. Let's completely utilize that stretch provision here. And the, the most interesting part about it, when I, when I saw it, I was like, is the American even going to be around in 2036? Like what, what happens if it just goes away? I, I, I don't know, but that was, it's probably bad that that was my original thought, but realignment, it, it's always happening. It never slows down. So I'm a little skeptical of the American cashing those checks in 2036, but we'll see. I'm sure it's written into that agreement. I'm sure there's some, some fancy legal language in there. Yeah. I'm I'm trying to remember one of the schools. I can't. It was it was it was one of the the smaller conferences, but their team switched conferences, and they were supposed to pay a buyout, and they just said no. <laughs> like no, yeah, we're not going to pay that. And you know, I, there wasn't really a whole lot that the other. I think they tried to go about it legally, but in the end, it wasn't going to be worth it. So they just kind of let them walk. Now, this is going to be more money. That's not going to happen. But I think it's smart for them to make the move now. Um, You know, go ahead and pay the buyout and start getting that that bigger payday because the payday they were getting previously was very, very small. Like just, what, three, four million dollars, I think, is what it was. So it's definitely going to be bigger than that. I don't, when did they start to get a full share? Do you know? I, I couldn't find those details, right. Of what type of, you know, what percentage or if they were getting a full share, I can't imagine they are, but I couldn't, I, I haven't seen any of that reported Have you. No, I haven't. But you know, a lot of that has to do with like kind of where you are bargaining wise. And the Big 12 was not in a very good position bargaining-wise whenever they accepted the four new teams with OU and Texas leaving. So my guess is they'll probably be getting a full share, you know, sooner than you would think. Yeah. I I don't know. It'll be it'll be interesting when those details come out. Okay. Last OU football thing. I mean, he just keeps doing interviews, so we gotta talk about it, man. I know we <laughs> I, we've tried to to move on from all the Lincoln Riley stuff, but listen, he he wasn't a big fan of talking to the media when he was OU's coach. But I guess things have changed because he just he keeps doing interviews. Ted uh, talked to Dennis Dodd from CBS, talked to Chris Lowe from ESPN. He is he's sticking with the story that the US th- USC thing all came together Sunday morning after uh, after that Bedlam loss. Okay, man, whatever. <laughs> sure. Uh, I, sure. But well, fine. But there were a few things in these interviews that he said that were interesting. First, he said, quote, I wasn't running from the SEC. I was running to USC. And that is that that's certainly one way of putting it. But I, I really don't think it's a coincidence he's doing all these interviews. And getting this message out there clearly. And we've talked about USC having a Dan Lanning organ problem on its hands. I'm guessing with what Oregon's doing with how they've kind of labeled themselves, the sec school on the West coast, right? I'm guessing that a lot of recruits have been hearing this message from those Oregon coaches and Lincoln Riley. I mean, he's trying to do his best to get out there. And and to dress and say no 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 I was going to USC I'm not scared of the SEC all that but clearly he's out here saying this stuff for a reason because in my experience he was not a guy that liked to do a lot of interviews and now he's doing a ton of them trying to get this message out there yeah well you know and it's he didn't like to do a whole lot of interviews before and, and my guess is because everything was always positive. Right. Everything you ever heard around Lincoln Riley, he was pretty much immune to criticism for a long time. 
And now going out to USC has opened him up to some criticism, obviously from OU fans, but, um, you know, general college football fans. The consensus is whether it's true or not, you know, is that, yes, he was scared of going to the SEC because he made the move post the OU to the SEC announcement, which, you know, he wasn't fired. He wasn't pushed out. He bailed. That, so it does make it look like that. And now that there's some of that narrative out there for the first time, he's had to go into some damage control. And he's, he's done more interviews, more national stuff. He's, he's, he's trying to be the face of that program out there. And you're exactly right. What we saw Tosh Lapoe right out of the gate whenever they took that job talking about, yeah, yeah, I, I, I remember Lincoln. We destroyed him in the, uh, the semifinal when he was at Alabama, um, 28-0 in the first half. He mentioned that right out of the gate. So it was, it was actually 28 to nothing in the first quarter. Yeah, that's what I was thinking. Um, yeah. But, you know, every single recruit that is being recruited by both USC and Oregon is going to hear the same type of stuff. There's no yeah. doubt. Yeah. Yeah, it's it's just interesting to see it keep coming up. But that quote, that quote really wasn't what, the one that got OU fans very fired up. Uh, this was the one that did the trick. I've walked into four playoffs and I've never had better than maybe the third best roster. Every other year we were four and four. We had really good rosters, but they weren't the same. I can't imagine there could be a setting that we could build a better roster than we can here. He's clearly talking about his ability to build a roster there out in LA at USC. Okay. I understood. I understand why this made OU fans so mad, right? Because it looks like, it looks like he's making excuses, right? That that's how it feels. Everyone wants to point to that Georgia game and the lead they had at halftime in that game. And I, I understand that, but he's not necessarily wrong. It, and I, I know that's, it, and it, it took me a while to come to grips with that. I was like, oh man, because you and I are the same way, Ted, like we, we were molded by Bob Stoops and anytime we came up short as a team, whether it was right or wrong, Bob always took the blame. I got to coach better. We got to play better. And it's my job to get them to play better. Like that's. You know, I got to do a better job. It's on me. I'm the leader of the program. Like that is, that is what we heard over and over and over time and time again, if we came up short and I don't love, and this just isn't a Lincoln Riley thing. I don't love when head coaches say, ah, well, you know, I, my players weren't as good. It, it just doesn't sit well, even though he may not be wrong. Right. When you go back and you look at the, if you just stack up all the rosters, like everyone brings up that Rose Bowl game, right? Oboe was the best player on that defense. And he was a, he was a really solid college player. Mm -hmm. But uh, Emmanuel Beal was the leading tackler on that defense. So it's not like there was a bunch of, elite defensive talent and now there were some guys that were high draft picks but they were young on that team you know like Kenneth Murray but I just don't think it sits well with OU fans because it sounds like a bunch of excuse making well it is excuse making and I agree I and this is one of the things that you know I've talked about with Lincoln and we talked about whenever you know, he, his departure came around. There was a lot of conversation about him. I can only think of one game, one, that he won whenever he didn't have the best roster, and that was at Ohio State. That's what everyone else in college football deals with for the most part, right? I mean, there's a handful of teams that have the best rosters, like, You've got to, like, we were just talking about Rocky Kamas and that 2000 national championship team. They beat a lot of teams that they did not have a better roster than, right? Now, part of it is turning those players, it doesn't always have to be draft picks. You can have a ton of really, really good college players 
that aren't necessarily high draft picks, but they are prepared, they're detailed, they're toughed, they're in shape, they're ready for the moment, and you go out and win games. Like, I don't know that – I mean, Clemson won two national championships, and I don't know that they had the – they didn't have the best roster in the country, I don't think. No. they had Now, they had really, really good rosters. Right. There, there's no doubt about it. But I – the reason I saw this and it made me a little upset is one, you know, the, the wound is still pretty fresh. Let's just be real about the, this whole situation. But our biggest complaint, at least, you know, our two biggest complaints that we had when Lincoln Riley was the head coach was a lack of development and at times a lack of toughness. Right. And that. Does do, do does developing players does that have a lot to do with talent? Yeah, somewhat, right? But that was the part that bothered me. And like, you can't say, "Oh, I didn't have the best roster," without also acknowledging the shortcomings when it came to developing the talent that you had. Right. That that was the big issue. It, it wasn't that you you didn't have a bunch of highly recruited guys. They did. You just didn't turn them into five-star players with the physical development and instilling the toughness and the discipline. Like, were, were there some guys that that happened with? Absolutely. There's no doubt. I'm not going to make it sound like it didn't happen with a single guy when Lincoln Riley was the head coach. That's not true. But there wasn't enough of it. There wasn't taking a guy that had some raw tools and turn him in it, turning him into an absolute monster. Like there, there was not enough of that during his tenure as head coach. And you can't talk about the roster being the third or fourth most talented when, when you're in the playoff without acknowledging, yeah, we, we probably didn't develop players the way that we should have. Or at least that's, that's what you and I were always complaining about at least. Right. Yeah. Well, I don't think there's any doubt. And, you know, I don't know. I, I'd say the 2017 year. That offense. Third best roster. I don't know. Pretty much every guy on that offense is an uh, all pro <laughs> or, or a pro bowl guy now. Uh, I mean, you've got how many starters? You, you had the Heisman Trophy winner. You had CD. D.D. Westbrook, Hollywood Brown, uh, what, Rodney Anderson. I know he hadn't had the NFL career. Mark Andrews. It's crazy, man. That offense was crazy. Entire O-line. Entire O-line. Yep. I, I, I understand where he's coming from, but it's just, it, this is, maybe this is the bottom line for it. He didn't need to say that. Right. He did. He didn't need to say that. Like he, you can, he's the head coach at USC now. So when he says things like, I don't think anywhere else is positioned like USC to build an elite roster. That's great. But you, you don't have to disparage your OU teams by when you're trying to build up USC. By saying, oh, I failed in the playoff because, you know, my players weren't that good at OU. But it, you, don't, you don't need to do that. And it's just another thing, just like they're running for the SEC thing, right? It's just another thing that Oregon coaches are going to use against him. Like, ah, oh, I blame it on these guys. He makes, makes a lot of excuses, kind of throws his guys under the bus. You see what he said about his OU players? Huh? I mean, it's just something that's going to be used against him. It's something he didn't need to say. There, there were nothing good came out of saying that. Nope. It doesn't reflect well on him. It doesn't make players that he coached at OU feel good. It doesn't it clearly makes the OU fan base even more upset with him. USC fans, like, are they saying it? Yeah, yeah. His his rosters weren't that good. That's why he lost in the playoff. Like, it, is that now a talking point for them? Maybe it is. I don't know. But I just saw that. I saw the backlash from OU fans and it just didn't need to be said. 
Nothing, nothing positive came out of it for him at all. Or maybe I'm missing something. I don't know. No, I mean, just from, just from the USC folks, that's all you're going to hear. But, you know, frankly, if they wanted it, like, like if this is really a, a, an answer to the way Oregon is recruiting him on the recruiting trail, this is just more fodder for them, right? Blaming it on the players. I mean, the guy had the Heisman Trophy winner in, in 2017, couldn't get it done. I mean, what else do you need? So, yeah, I don't know. I I can't see how it's a positive really anyway, but he's I, – I don't know. It's so strange. It's almost as strange – It's well, nothing's going to be as strange as continuing to try and tell everyone that the deal came together on Sunday. But this is kind of goes right into that, right into that group is is was where this one falls. Yeah, I, I don't know, I I don't know. But it was uh, it we, we had to talk about it because OU fans were uh, were not pleased. <laughs> we're not pleased with some of the things he said in those interviews. All right, let's get to call your shot. We asked you guys the most important thing that happened for OU football this week. And this first one comes from Jay Boogie on Twitter, who says the return of coaching camps where top level players actually participate has proved to be fruitful in finding players, some of which OU has offered. It seems like a huge success. And another one came from Sooner Script, who said most important thing, incredible turnout of an enthusiasm by elite talent at the OU camps. BV has put a big emphasis on these. It sounds like they're pretty fired up, fired up about some of the guys that showed up. And this is a great reminder to everyone because the camps, there's no doubt they had fallen off, right? If, if you challenge kids and you say, Hey, come compete. There are still kids out there that want to compete and want to prove what they got. I know I know a lot of people think that ah oh, kids these days and all that stuff. Listen. If you give them the opportunity and you push them towards that opportunity to come and compete, kids still want to show what they could do, man. And it sounds like that uh that's been happening a lot at these camps, which is which is fun. It's the way it should be. Well, there's there's You know, one of the realities of recruiting is that you're going to have some hits and you're going to have some misses, right? One of the problems is you're, you're watching film. You may get to see a couple of games live. You're talking to his high school coach. You're talking to his family. You're not going to get any real, real world feedback. There's no better way for talent evaluation to occur than right there in the flesh, coaching, putting them through drills, watching them compete against other, other high caliber players. How do they respond? How do they, how do they act with their peers? Are they guys that, that you want in the locker room or the guys you don't want in the locker room? It's the best evaluation that they can have. You actually get to be around them. Yeah. How about that? And one of the cool things we talked a little bit about this, but now that the current players can work the camps and get paid for that, like you also get some of the current players interacting with these kids and believe it or not, kids usually open up a little more to other kids as opposed to the coaches. So you can have, you can have your current players being little moles for you as well. So it, it's just, it makes all the sense in the world to invest in your camp system. And I am, I'm really, I'm really happy where this thing appears to be building, like where it's at right now, but where it seems to be building for the future with, with how they're approaching this whole thing. And the high school camps are, they're critical, right? The prospect camps are, there's good players coming in, but the little kids camp is, is really important too. You're planting the seed for future Sooner fans and for little kids to go up there, interact with some of the players and some stuff like that. 
you just can't recreate that. And you can make some big time Sooner fans from that early age. And you never know what some of those guys are going to turn into. And a- after people listen to this podcast, I assume they're going to send their kids to camp instead of Disney world. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Right. Hopefully, hopefully that's what we would have loved to, or I would have loved to have done, but Baker Mayfield camp coming up at the end of June. What's a, uh... What's Edwards' arm situation looking like? Can you rip it? We, we, we talking future QB here? I think we're talking future defensive end or something. Okay. <laughs> Crazy. <laughs> okay. Say no more. Gotcha. <laughs> All right. Birthday shout outs. They've piled up a little bit. You ready? Oh, yeah. Let's get it. Happy third birthday to Gilbert Victor Kurtz. Happy fifth birthday to Rhett Phillips. Happy sixth birthday to Audrey Ann Board. Happy sixth birthday to Jackson Wilson. Enjoy Orange Beach, Jackson. Happy 10th birthday to Riker Brock. Happy 15th birthday to Kylie Montgomery. Happy 28th birthday to Dr. Brooks Taylor. Happy 29th birthday to Tanner Bang Brady. Happy... (laughs) I've got questions about the nickname there. <laughs> happy 29th birthday to ooh. Happy 29th birthday to Zach Zeke. Zeke. I think that's Zeke. I Zeke. could be wrong. Z E K K E. Zeke. Zach. Zeki. Stump. <laughs> happy happy 60- birthday. Happy 62nd birthday to Caitlin. Herbert. Happy. That's not Herbert. Hebert. Hebert. Caitlin Hebert. Happy. You skipped like two lines too. Oh, I did. Happy 62nd (laughs) birthday to Kent Carter. Happy 79th birthday to George McDowell. Oh my God. We're awful. Happy birthday to Wes Leos. Happy birthday to Bob Kramer. Congratulations to the Haas family on the birth of Britt Channing Haas. Congratulations to the Garrel family on the birth of Paxton Garrel. Garrel? Garrel. Garrel. Garrel? Yeah. Congratulations to the Garrel family. That's way better. Paxton Garrel. Yeah, I think that's right. Congratulations to Matt and Kendall on the birth of Liam Jackson Casey. And happy first anniversary to Carrie and Christina Bailey. And happy sixth anniversary to Andrew and Madeline Goodman. All right. It's time to talk some softball, baby. But first, the only place to stop when you're road tripping is Love's Travel Stops. Love's has over 600 locations in 41 states, offering 24-hour access to clean and safe places. Whatever your road trip needs are, Love's has it. Fuel, fresh food, all the snacks and drinks, including, yes, my favorite, Java Amore. That coffee is fantastic. Love's also has you covered if you forget your phone charger or headphones. They've expanded their mobile-to-go zone so you can grab any of that stuff there. Make sure you download the Love's Connect app for exclusive offers from today's most popular brands. The Love's Connect app also includes a route planner and store locator. When you see that red neon heart on the highway, Stop in and say hi at Love's Travel Stops. For a full list of what Love's has to offer, visit loves.com. Opolis Clothing is the exclusive home for all of our Oklahoma Breakdown merchandise. If you want to live your life in buttery soft comfort, go to opolisclothing.com. That's O-P-O-L-I-S clothing.com and use promo code TED, T-E-D, for 10% off your entire order. You still get a discount on all the OU and OKC Thunder gear as well. That's opolisclothing.com. Use promo code TED for 10% off. Buttery soft and 10% off. And make sure you send your kids to Bishop McGinnis Catholic High School. Bishop McGinnis Catholic High School has a long tradition of educational excellence with a 12 to 1 student to teacher ratio. No student is overlooked. Bishop McGinnis's college prep curriculum offers 22 AP courses. There are numerous clubs and organizations for students to join. And as a proud member of the OSSAA, there are 14 sports offered. If you want to provide the best possible educational and spiritual development for your children, contact Bishop McGinnis Catholic High School or visit bmchs.org. 
Remember, financial aid is available. All right, a couple football guys are going to talk some softball. Football guys talking softball. The Oklahoma softball team wins their sixth national title via back-to-back titles. This is their fourth in six tournaments. They finished 59-3 and on the season. They won 40 games via run rule. Would have been 42 if there was a run rule, if there was a mercy rule in the champ series. Any way you cut it, four of six, Ted. That, my friend, is a dynasty. Impressive. Really, really impressive stuff. They totally mowed through the competition this year. I know they lost that one to UCLA uh, in the World Series, but there was not a doubt from beginning of the season who the best team in college softball was, and it's a lot of pressure whenever you start off the year as, you know, the overall number one, the the favorite to win it all, right? to hold it together, to put in the work, to continue the grind, that's, that's not easily done. So kudos to that group. And I, I got to say, man, they are poised right now to continue that run. It, it does not appear to be slowing down at all. Right, I, I think the pitching staff is only going to get better. Yep. And w- with what they have done from a strength and conditioning standpoint, how well they're recruiting, like I, I'm not trying to say that they're not going to miss Jocelyn Allo, the arguably the best hitter in the history of college softball. But I think the offensive firepower is going to be just fine. But you you mentioned that UCLA loss. I I thought the way that they bounced back. Right, They got that 30-minute break, they regroup, and they beat the absolute shit out of them in game two. I, I thought the way that they composed themselves and handled that situation, right? Patty Gasso, when she came on here, talked about that championship mindset. That was exactly the definition of that championship mindset. Hey, pass is the pass. We're moving on. Jocelyn Allo in the dugout saying, hey, we're only playing five innings. That was one of the most <laughs> badass things I've ever seen. And for them to bounce back, and what was that game, like 15 to nothing? Or 15-0, I think, yeah. For them to do that right after they had just lost to that team, that was, that was incredible to watch. To have right. that type of resolve and to be able to bounce back that quickly told me everything I needed to know about that team. Well, who else could could right before the postseason lose their ace pitcher in softball and still go rip off a, a national championship, you know? Um, and I know Jordy came back and threw some, but clearly was not it was not the same. Um, but awesome. <laughs> I think it told the whole story. I think it was the second inning of game one of the world series. Whenever the Texas coach is like, yeah, we'll bounce. We'll come back tomorrow and, and, and see what we've got. It's like, hang on. It's, it's like six to one, man. It's not over yet, but he already knew at that point. All right. It, once you lose the lead, it's game over. Yeah. Mike white. He, he certainly is a straight shooter. That That's for sure. But yeah, just, just thinking about the championship series, Right? How fun is it that they just got to destroy Texas twice to win a national title? But I was when I was watching game one, that was about as a stress-free watching experience you'll ever get as a college sports fan. I mean, what, six home runs, just an absolute assault of the Texas Longhorns. I, I was just sitting there watching just I, I'm sure I had the just goofiest smile on my face. I had never been that relaxed watching an OU team play for a championship. It was a, it was an incredible feeling. Game one was, oh my God. I if I could if I could replicate that feeling every you know, a couple times a year, I, my quality of life would be so much better, Ted. Yeah, to be in a champ have a champ uh, a stress free championship game like that is is awesome um yeah we were we were hooping and hollering watching in the hotel rooms and 
it was just it, shooting gallery, dropping bombs, everyone hitting monster shots. A lot of fun watching them uh, them play so well. And man, those bats came alive, didn't they? As soon as they got in the tournament, as soon as they got to that first regional, right after the Big Twelve tourney, the bats were red hot and they didn't stop. Yeah, and game two of the champ series, it was a little more suspenseful, right? You mentioned Jordy Ball; she clearly didn't have her best stuff but the defense man that's Ooh. that's what makes yeah. it like they at at some points in the season it was the pitching and then at some points it was it was the offense but the defense really is what i thought gave them the momentum in that game like jada coleman was a beast in center field i mean the catch that robbed that home run that was clearly a massive play Maybe the, two robs. One of them, it looked like maybe was going over too. It was, it was, that was great. And that picture, that's up there. Like when you talk about coolest pictures in the history of OU athletics, her up way over the wall catching that, like that is, cool. that, that is an all-timer uh, of a play. And I, I just, I continue to be impressed with how complete their players are, right? I mean, defense. The, the bats, when when they heated up in game two, my goodness, did they heat up. It, even even a girl like Kenzie Hansen, right, who it's it's been a rough year, right, after an awesome season for her last year. Like, it's been a bit of a struggle for her this year. It had to feel so good when she hit that bomb in game two, right, and, and the Grace Lions homer to cement things in that game and to allow me to live stress-free even more watching them on their way to a national title. Like that was, that was awesome. But Jocelyn Allo's curtain call, the lead up to it. That was one of the cooler things I've ever seen in OU athletics. Like the fact that both balls went to her, she made both plays and then they got to pull her and everybody got to show their appreciation for it. That was now she's one of the best to ever do it. So she deserves that. But just the way that that all lined up and worked out, it was like something out of a movie, man. It was, it was incredible. It was great. Yeah. Those two plays and it was all like smiles and giggles, you know, making those two plays out there, two pop-ups until she saw that she was coming out of the game and it would just hit her like a ton of bricks. And, you know, what a feeling uh, to be able to play your last game and get a curtain call be able to walk off the field to that type of ovation being a national champion that's that's as good as it gets right there as good as it gets and as bright as the future for OU softball is you don't know when you're going to have the next Jocelyn Allo and I know Tiari Jennings like it feels like she's <laughs> she's very close right but I think Allo's run in the NCAA tournament this year, like it put her on the Mount Rushmore of OU athletes for me. No doubt. Like she, I mean, she is that dude. And it was, it was fun to watch her rake, man. I, I, I don't plan on forgetting it anytime soon. You know, it, it is something whenever someone is so good that, you know, and, and we watched a lot of the games here at the house, like out by the pool with, you know, the neighbors over and stuff. It's, you got to be something special whenever someone says, hey, Jocelyn Allo's up. And like everyone gets out of the pool and everyone comes and stands around the the TV. I, and that's what she does. And, th and that's just, that's rare. It's It's extremely rare to have someone that's that good at what they do to where it's must-see TV, you drop everything else that you're doing, you go and watch that at bat. Yeah. It, you, especially the postseason this year, does not disappoint. Oh, my gosh. Just just ridiculous. But another national title for Patty Gasso, who continues to be the best in the business. I, I think a lot of people, including myself, believe she's the best ever. And like you said, man, it ain't slowing down. Anytime soon. And that new stadium's gonna come. They're only gonna get better. They're gonna have better resources, better facilities, better recruiting tools because of those. I mean it's crazy. 
And I, I'm just one more quick thing for me about about this team, and it's not just this team; it's last year's team and and all of Patty's teams. They get a ton of credit for their pitching, and pitching in softball is, you know, it, it's everything. Obviously, the offense with the bats and and how well they score. But you mentioned their defense. I, I thought watching them against the best of the best, whether it's Oklahoma State or Texas or whoever they played, the real separate, like the visually, the biggest separation is their defense. All of Agreed. the errors. And I, I think it's I think it's stress that teams put themselves on whenever they're playing against OU, like trying to be too fast, trying to maybe do too much, but they just do not make the mistakes that you routinely see from the other teams. Well, and not to rub it in for Oklahoma State, but just think of that one disastrous play Mm -hmm. is the reason they weren't in the championship series. And I, and some people may disagree. I think it would have been a much better championship series if Oklahoma State would have been in there. I agree. Totally agree. But yeah. And then Texas just throwing the ball all over the place. In yep. those two games in the championship series. So, Which, it, you know, and it's crazy that they made it there because I think they were the, they had the most errors in the big 12, led the big 12 in errors, which that's tough to do and, and find your way into the championship series, but they got exposed, I guess you should say. Uh, they did. <laughs> they did indeed. They did indeed. Um, the celebration for this national championship team. They're going to hold off on the celebration until the fall. It'll be at Marita Heinz field. They are doing it during their alumni weekend. So it will allow a lot of former players to be back there as well. And I'm sure those details will come out uh, a little before that event. And I, I assume it's going to be a hell of a turnout to show uh, for OU fans to show their appreciation for another national title for OU softball. All right, let's finish up with our winners and losers of the weekend. But first, it's time to get back out on the golf course, people. And there's nothing better to drink on the course than the number one seltzer in golf, Clubby Seltzers. Clubby Seltzers is an Oklahoma company that is already winning national awards because their product is delicious, tastes exactly like a club special, but it's a seltzer. They're not just for the golf course either. They're perfect to drink by the pool, after mowing the lawn, whatever. If you haven't tried Clubby Seltzers yet, go grab some. You won't regret it. Clubby's Variety Pack is out. I had some today. I tried the grape. It was fantastic. If you want to find a place near you that has Clubby's, visit ClubbySeltzers.com. And attention, business owners. You need Insurica in your life. Yeah, you do. Insurica is one of the country's largest insurance brokers with 30 offices throughout Oklahoma, Texas, and the Southwest. Insurica is able to customize programs by accessing the latest information from many insurance carriers. They compare and contrast coverage offerings and pricing in order to design a cost-effective, comprehensive program to meet your business's specific needs. Insurica's clients become best-in-class businesses by working with Insurica's team of advisors to manage risk. Purchasing insurance is only one way to protect your business. Best-in-class businesses win by avoiding a loss in the first place. If your business partners with Insurica, you'll save huge amounts of money and take back control of your total cost of risk. I'm an Insurica client, and you should be too. If your business wants to be best in class, connect with Insurica at Insurica.com. That's I-N-S-U-R-I-C-A dot com. As always, Ted, kick us off. Who do you have as your winner of the weekend? OU baseball, baby. In. Unbelievable. Um three game series against Virginia tech uh, looked amazing in game one game two, Virginia tech had the bats out. We're dropping bombs and with everything on the line uh, was it Cade Horton went out there had an awesome start. Baseball team is hot right now. They are red hot. Got a matchup with Texas A&M. Was it next Friday? I believe things get underway. Yes, in sir. Omaha. First time, I believe, since 2010, since they've been awesome, awesome stuff. Um, team just caught fire the back half of the regular season, the Big 12 season, and they haven't looked back. I I have watched more OU baseball 
in the last two weeks agree than I've watched in the last several years combined. I, I'm not going to lie. So if you want to call me a ba- bandwagon OU baseball fan, then, hey, guilty. I'm fine with that. You, but, hey, I'm an OU alum. I, I, I cheer for them when they're playing, and this is the first time in a long time that I've paid very close attention to what's going on. And watching them slowly dismantle Virginia Tech on Sunday was awesome. This is great. Great pitching. Uh, Playing the outfield was awesome. Kendall Pettis has been unbelievable in the postseason. Unbelievable. Did you see him go flipping into the bullpen, making that catch? Flipping over the bullpen. He made another diving catch. I, I'm, I don't know what he's hitting in the postseason, but it's insane. He's scoring so many runs and getting on base and and just – I think he's the nine-hole hitter too. Yeah. And, and he's been on fire. So, they're just – they're a lot of fun to watch, man. A lot of fun right now. I'm with you. Keep up with OU baseball typically through Toby Rowland, and I don't think I've missed a game since they started the Big 12 tourney been a lot of fun. I, I will say I thought Treadaway was huge in that game three, right? The momentum that those yeah. bombs brought, I thought that that was massive. I, Peyton Graham could actually absolutely rake for a skinny dude. I, I mean, know. it's unbelievable to watch. And he's got, he's got a little bit of style to him as well. Whenever he hits a bomb, he stands there and stares at it, which uh, the Florida players didn't like a whole lot, but – uh, which, by the way, I know we're skipping to the Virginia Tech deal, but beating Florida felt good. That oh, felt yeah. good. That I when they lost that second game, I was like, "Oh my gosh, this is." <laughs> it was bad enough where I thought maybe they're going to lose all of their momentum, but they were able to bounce back and get a win. But um, you're right; he's he's got a whip for an arm at that shortstop spot, and he he's got some bat speed. He he's like, you see that guy, and it's almost like a golfer, right? Yes. Yep. Where you're like, he's long. He's getting like, there's no way that dude. And then you see the speed he generates with those long levers. You're like, oh my gosh. Yep, he's a good player, man. They've got a fun team. They're, you know, I'm I'm not a baseball guy, but you know, having that belief and catching fire and having momentum is as critical as anything. And they've had it and they've held on to it, man. I will say this it, just with softball winning the national title baseball now headed to Omaha, which by the way, we should try to go to that. That would be so much fun. That would be awesome. I've never been would love to go, but baseball and softball, like the format, the postseason format, may be my favorite format in college athletics. You get a lot of face time, don't you? Well, it's not only that. Like, I feel like you really get the best teams, like uh, the, the teams that are playing the best way, the, that the three-game super regional, the way that the regionals work. Like, I don't know. It just feels like their it's format. To, you, can't, you can't fluke your way through. Yeah, it, it's yeah. not it, as much as we love March Madness, right? Sometimes, like, the best teams don't make it to the Final Four. Like, if you played three-game series, I, I don't know. I just really, I really enjoy Other the way Other than Notre Dame format. knocking off Tennessee, the massive one seed, which that's great. I'm, <laughs> hey, they had a great team. They were fun to watch, but I think that helps everyone else's chances out quite a bit. That was cool to see. Yeah. So, it's just, it's a really good format. I, I don't I know. I don't. I don't think you can replicate it in football or anything like that, but college basketball, if they did something like that, that'd be awesome. I know that it'll never happen because March Madness is makes so much money, but I'm just, I'm just saying really enjoy the regional than super regional than the world I series agree. format. So it's, it's cool. All right. Who do you have as your loser of the weekend? <laughs> I had to go with, uh, Tua Tunga Vailoa down oh boy. at Miami, you know, it's not his fault that Tyreek Hill is going out and writing checks that he is not going to be able to cash. But like, Tyreek Hill is basically making everyone scrutinize Tua 
more than they should. I think Tua is probably going to come into his own and have his best season yet. But come on, dude. You don't have to go out there, Tyreek, and start saying that he's more accurate than Patrick Mahomes. I don't even care if it's true. You know, no one, no one is going to take your word for it on that. They're just going to, it's going to start a rant, uh, a round of Tua slander that didn't even need to happen. He, he really, do you, do you think Tua is sitting there like, Hey, thanks Tyreek. I appreciate it. I appreciate you setting up all these people to dunk on me because <laughs> like, really, you're going to say he's more accurate than Mahomes. Come on, man. What are we doing? I, hey, I, I get Mahomes' last couple of games in the playoffs. He, he didn't have his best stuff necessarily. But you're throwing in, like, helmets and, and shorts right now, okay, if you're wearing helmets at all. Don't start that comparison yet. Maybe if you're halfway through the season and two is complete, like, 70-plus percentage of his passes, maybe start talking about it then. But right now, all you're doing is bringing a ton of heat on Tua that he doesn't need at the moment. I, it's just, it's so unnecessary, right? No, it's know. just, it's so unnecessary. And for also, he kind of went at Andy Reid. Also, it's like, what do you, what, what do you do? Like Andy Reid and Patrick Mahomes, they're going to be just fine next season yep. without Tyreek Hill. Like they'll be just fine. Andy Reid. And Patrick Mahomes just got Tyreek Hill. Uh, what I, I don't know how big his contract is. Probably eighty million bucks, seventy million bucks. Now what he got? Like he own he owes everything to those two guys for that because he probably doesn't go off the way he did in Kansas City anywhere else. Yeah, he he's got incredible speed. There's no doubt about it. I'm sure he's going to be productive in Miami, but. Man, you just had a hell of a run. Some really successful years in Kansas City. Why, why say this dumb stuff? Like, what, what good comes from it? He should have left it whenever he said he was way more accurate than he expected. Done. Yeah. That's it. That's great. That's great. Everyone's like, good. Do it. That's good. That's great. Right? That's and awesome. Now, How about this to a guy? And he just, he just got, he really escalated. Oh, he's more accurate. You know, he's more accurate than Mahomes. Mahomes wouldn't have been anything without me. What? I mean, it's just, I mean, it's so much easier for him to play quarterback. Well, yeah, that's probably true, but it is so amazing. It's just unnecessary, man. Yeah. And two has got to be sitting there going, I mean, really, man, like just, you couldn't just leave it at that one compliment. I, I appreciate it, but God, <sighs> why? I don't know. To a poor two. All right. Let's get to my winner and loser. But first, First Fidelity Bank is a full service financial institution based in Oklahoma with tailored solutions for all your personal and business needs, checking accounts, saving accounts, home loans, and much more. They do it all, whether it's online banking from your computer or mobile banking from your phone. Everything is stress free with FFB. Making mobile deposits, paying bills online, and moving money to different accounts could not be easier. First Fidelity Bank provides free ATMs worldwide making banking convenient wherever you are. They also give back to the community. FFB donates a total of more than $500,000 to local charities and educational foundations. Make your life easier and go bank with First Fidelity Bank. Visit ffb.com for more information. And if you're a whiskey or bourbon drinker, stop what you're doing, head to your favorite liquor store and buy some Balcones products. You got to grab some of Balcones Lineage Single Malt Whiskey it was just voted one of the top 20 whiskeys in the world by Whiskey Advocate, and you'll be shocked by how affordable it is. Also, you got to snag some of Balcones Baby Blue Corn Whiskey. It's made from blue corn. That's the fancy corn. And that is why it has won more than 25 awards. Last but certainly not least, you got to buy some of Balcones Pot Still Bourbon. Its big flavors make it the perfect bourbon to drink year-round. Remember, in 2012, Balcones Single Malt won the Best in Glass competition, beating brands like Johnny Walker and McAllen. It became the first American distillery to win that competition. This stuff is the real deal, people. If you love great whiskey and bourbon at a great price, then Balcones products are the only way to go. The whiskey may be made in Texas, but the owners, yes, they are from Oklahoma. To find a liquor store that has it, visit BalconesDistilling.com. All right, for my winner of the weekend, 
thought about going with LeBron James. Guy became a billionaire playing basketball. That's it's pretty damn sweet. Pretty good. Pretty good. Also says he's got his eyes on NBA ownership and says he wants in in Vegas. And I, I know uh, there are a lot of people that talked about this, but LeBron playing for the Vegas team in its inaugural season, that would not suck. I would like to watch that. That would be, that would be crazy. I still feel like of all the professional teams, an NBA team in Vegas is the one most likely to go horribly wrong, but uh, I'm still here for it. I think it's going to be awesome. And if LeBron can get a group together, probably going to have a good opportunity for it. You know, I don't know. I don't know what, what the, what the price tag is going to be to start one up, but it's going to be a lot. It's going to be big. And uh, I know he knows the right people. What he's already a part owner in, one of the soccer teams in the Red Sox, right? Yeah, Liverpool. Yeah, yeah. He's he's part of that. Yeah, it's like the I, I forgot what the group is called, but they definitely it's it's Fenway something, and yeah, it's Red Sox, Liverpool. So he's he's got stakes in in a few professional franchises as well already. So I, it makes a lot of sense. For the NBA, give them a piece of the Vegas team, become the face of that team, and then transition into ownership. That would be, that would be really cool. I would enjoy that. It's pretty. It's it's wild to uh, LeBron James going Jackie Moon on us and um, playing for his own team. That'd be awesome. Be that would be special. That would be pretty cool. But my winner of the weekend, Steph Curry. And by the way, I don't know why they're not playing an NBA Finals game on Sunday night, but but it is what it is. Monday night is is game game five's on Monday night, but game four, Steph Curry put the Warriors on his back and carried them to a victory in Boston to even up that series two to two. Forty three points, hit seven threes, also had ten rebounds in the game, and. Ted, I know you don't love the mouthpiece. I know we all still have some hate in our heart for Steph Curry for, you know, when the Warriors and Thunder were going at it years ago. But that was so fun to watch. And, and when you talk about great players, I think what makes guys truly great is stepping up in the biggest moments and dragging your team to victory. And that's what separates the all-time greats from guys that were really, really good. And that's exactly what Steph Curry did in game four. Performances like that are what make him truly one of the all-time greats. Yes, he's the best shooter ever, I understand, but his team needed him, and boy, did he deliver. That was, dude, what, no matter how you feel about the guy, that was fun to watch. But yep. that that was fun to watch. He is he's amazing. The shot making, the 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 handle he's got just he's just unbelievable. He's an absolute freak. But someday, many years from now, when he's looking back on his great career and he's scrolling through all the photos and every single photo whether it's a game winning shot or you know, a big time play or, you know, a celebration afterwards. He's going to say, why in the hell did I have that stupid mouthpiece hanging out of my mouth for all of these pictures? It's going to be horrible. It's going to be horrible. Like it, every iconic picture of Steph Curry is going to have like a spit infested, chewed up mouthpiece hanging out of his mouth. It's horrible. I, I wonder, and he was shooting some clutch free throws and he, he was gnawing on it the way that I know you hate. Mm -hmm. And it made me think like how influential is Steph Curry? Because I think just from when, when visiting teams come and play the thunder, like I always pay attention, like, okay, who's, who's got the biggest pull with, with kids, right? Like who do you see the most kids wearing jerseys? Steph Curry, he's got to be the most popular player amongst kids by a lot 
It's crazy. It's insane. Do you think he is influencing America's youth negatively? Do you think they are they are chewing or they are using mouthpieces improperly because of his influence? Is this uh, is this an epidemic? We're going to look back and we're going to blame this sudden rash of mouth injuries and concussions in basketball directly to Steph Curry. That's what's going to happen. Teeth problems, <laughs> a direct, a direct result of the way that Steph Curry chews on it his really mouth. It really is crazy I, though. And I know we've talked about this, but I, I, I still can't think of anyone in any other sport that has changed it the way that it's played so drastically in such a short amount of time as Steph Curry. Yeah. And he, he was so good in that game. And I will give the rest of the Warriors some credit. The game was on the line and they completely shut the Celtics down. Right. That, I mean, they defended their asses off and now the Celtics couldn't hit any shots. It things got really stagnant for them offensively. Marcus smart is the ultimate, like, Oh, it's my time. Here we go. I'm taking over. <laughs> He's just, Oh man. It's gotta be such a love hate relationship. If you're a Celtics fan with Marcus smart, man, it's gotta be, it's, it's gotta be brutal at times, but they really ramped the defense up and guys stepped up like Kevon Looney had like the most important basket of the entire game. Yeah. And it was, it was a heck of a win by the Warriors. Cause man, I thought that that, I thought Boston was going to go up three, one and that series was pretty much going to be over. And all I care about, cause I, I don't want either of these teams to win an NBA championship. I just wanted to go to seven games and I want that seventh game to be suspenseful as hell because game four, I had a ton of fun watching it. I would like to get to a game seven and have a similar experience. Yeah. There's been a lot of blowouts through these playoffs. Uh, oh, it's, it's been crazy. so many. And, you know, I never thought that I would reach a point to where I would say that no matter who they're playing, no matter who's on the, on the floor that I would say Draymond green's my favorite player out there. But here I am myself from two years ago would have slapped the hell out of me right now for saying that, but I I don't know what it is. There's been a little bit of maturity there for Draymond green as well. Probably for myself uh, also, but I enjoy watching the guy play. How sad is that? He, he is a broken man offensively. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and Steve Kerr, he, he didn't bench him, but he kind of did. It was like a little offense defense thing late, but he sat him down and that's really when they made the run. And that had to be a, he had to be sitting there going, well, okay, it's come to this. Like <laughs> I, and now everyone's just, it, whether he plays well, whether he plays poorly, like it, now everyone just talks about the podcast. <laughs> like it's just, he's got all kinds of things going on, but I'll tell you this. He's going to be a, he's made a ton of money playing basketball. He's probably got, you know, a couple of years left. He's going to make a ton of money in broadcasting. Yeah. He's going to be great. Speaking of ton of money, and this is off topic, but really quickly, are the Pelicans insane? Are they really going to give give Zion a max rookie extension? I don't really know what else they're supposed to do. <laughs> I I know, uh, dude. Like, you want me to tell I, you what they do? They cut him or trade him or just let the contract expire. That's what they have to do. You, when you're the Pelicans, right. And you're a, you know, a smaller market team in the NBA, you can't lose that type of asset for nothing. Remember when we lost Durant for nothing, like it is you. So it, remember, and he's played 80 something games in his career, which clearly he's missed a ton of time, but when he played, he was awesome. I mean, he was unstoppable when he played. So I guess you, if you're David Griffin and the leadership there for the Pelicans, you just have to hope he gets in shape. Oh, yeah. I, I don't know what other choice they have. They would like, they would have. I don't I, know. I, 
sign and trade. There's got to be someone that wants him, right? I don't know. Maybe not. I, I guess they are kind of in a, in a tough spot, but I got news for you. He ain't going to play. He's going to be hurt. He's going to be overweight. He's going to be hurt, and it's going to be a never-ending cycle. He will not last through this next contract in the NBA. Yeah. I, it's my fear that we've already seen his best. I know. Which is a bummer because he's incredibly entertaining to watch play basketball. Yeah. He's a freak. But, yeah, you, your body is your most important asset when you are a professional athlete. It's kind of the whole thing. And he just he hasn't taken care of himself the way you need to. So, We'll see if that we'll see if that changes, but I think they're doing the only thing they really can do, and they got to pay him. And it's not great, but it is what it is. All right, for my loser of the weekend, thought about going with the PGA Tour because Ooh. hey, Rory wins there in Toronto, awesome, right? Nineteen under, it was fun to watch. I think he won one point six million. Meanwhile, Charles Schwartzel won the first live golf event and took home a cool 4.75 million. I didn't even realize the PGA played this weekend. Did that even happen? It did. And Rory McIlroy, one of who has now become like the voice of reason in golf, won the event. But all anyone is talking about is Schwartzel. And remember, he won the individual. So he took that home. And then his team what stinger GC or whatever the hell it's called. The, those graphics are awful. The broadcast was actually pretty good. I watched quite a bit of it. There's no commercials. Yeah. You're just watching guys pound the golf ball. It's yeah. kind of awesome. Now the graphic, that little sidebar that needs some work. I mean, guys, we got to, it just looks ridiculous. But as far as getting to watch guys play golf, pretty solid. I mean, pretty solid, but he won the individual. His team won the team competition, which is like seven hundred and fifty thousand yeah. dollars that he took away from that. Because four I think guys he, split three million, right? And that yeah. how that went? Yeah, yeah. But I saw this from ESPN. Schwartzel won more prize money in that event than he'd won in the last four years combined. Wow. Other guys are going to see that and be like, hold up. What? I'm better than Charles Schwartzel. Like, and we just saw it, right? Patrick Reed and DeChambeau making the move to it. That is, I mean, Charles Schwartzer won well, like $5 million and Rory got 1.6. Yep. What? Here's the thing, too. I mean, like, is, the PGA, to, in my opinion, the way the PGA is handling this, which, you know, part of me understands because this is a direct threat. Like that type of money and that type of purse is a big time threat for them. But the way that they're going about it and, and hammering these guys and, and talking about like, obviously the, the Saudi Arabia thing, Man, you don't have to. You don't even have to go a layer deep to see the PGA and where they accept money. They expect they accept money from China. They got the PGA China Tour, which they're in trouble over. Um, Saudi Arabia, the same fund that started the the Live Golf, is heavily invested in the PGA through the Fanatics Tour Shop. I mean, come on! Like a lot of the sponsors. You can start looking like who who is going to decide who you can who you can do business with, what's acceptable to take take money from, what countries it's it's acceptable to take money from. Uh, it's a that's a dangerous road to go down. If you want to start calling people out, you better take a look at your own bank accounts and where that money's coming from. Yeah, and I, I will say this: a little a uh, little peek behind the curtain here of the podcast. Before before the PGA Championship at Southern Hills, we were supposed to have Taylor Gooch on the pod. And a couple hours before we were supposed to record, and we were all, you and I were both fired up about it. He was fired up about it. He sent us a message. Hey, I got to get some contract stuff figured out, and, like, I got to get it figured out tonight. It now makes a lot more sense what he had to do. Yeah. 
him and yeah. his agent were figuring out this contract. So, and, and it was a big deal because huge you know, deal. It, uh, it turned into okay. I'm going to go try it out. To it's like now you've got to pick between the two. You know, and I think he what had a ninth place finish, and uh, what I think he was over 500k that he won, which is a, a really nice payday for for a top ten. But you know, whenever you think about it. Like, if you're not going to win five majors and you kind of know where you are, uh, you're not going to break. If you if you're realistic and you're not going to break through and you're not going to be one of the top handful of guys that get all of the sponsor money and and win the majors, then okay, you're looking at the money situation, right? And you talked about it, like four point seven five for Charles Schwartzel. Like everyone's going to be looking at that a little bit different after that. You know, because it's one thing to see it all and to know how much money they're going to get, but whenever it actually happens, it's like. So hang on, what are the details to this again? <laughs> Can you tell me about it again? Tell, I I do think the the most interesting part about this, you know, the guys that have gone and played now, is are they going to be allowed to play be be allowed to play in the majors, right? Because they're not allowed to play in the PGA. Um, events even on sponsor exemptions like they're they're not like they made that clear which which was a big development but like can phil mickelson really not play in the masters right you got the what is it the masters and the u.s open and even i guess the british isn't isn't a pga is right. it and remember i think the pga tour is technically a little different like than the pga of america that so they got, they're going to have to make that decision. I would assume that decision's coming relatively soon, but I, I'll say this. I was a bottom of the roster guy in the NFL. If someone would have said, hey, you can go play in this league. There will be less competition. And we'll pay you a ton of money. Way more money than you're making now. I probably would have did that. Yeah. Probably would have did that. It's hard to it's hard to really disc. I know the PGA is trying like hell to discredit these guys and really saying some some pretty bad things about them, considering uh, some of the people that the PGA Tour does business with. But um, yeah, if you're going to be playing golf and you got a chance to make way more money, you're probably going to try and make way more money. Yep. Not that not that difficult of a yeah, formula. It, it's going to be fascinating to see how this thing continues to develop. I mean, it it really is. And I want to know. And I, listen, I think I think the Saudis that they're good for the money. <laughs> right. I want to know when that direct deposit hits Schwartzel's account. That's what I want to know. Right. Yeah. Yeah. That's that's going to be a good feeling. That's but crazy. My loser of the weekend. Oh, you thought just because I'm all the way out here in Hawaii that I wasn't going to be watching that Azerbaijan Grand Prix, Ted? Wrong, my friend. <laughs> Ferrari, my loser of the weekend, man. Carlos Sides, brake issues. Charles Leclerc, engine blows up on him. Complete engine failure. Neither of the red pony cars finish. Two DNFs now in the last three, three races for Leclerc. It's all falling apart for the Frenchman, Ted, and... Guess who won? Just guess. Uh, my guess is Verstappen. You're a genius, man. Well, it's not that hard with Mercedes porpoising like crazy and the Ferraris can't even finish a race. There's only really one person left. Well, hey, George Russell, he's he's finding a groove there in Mercedes, and he, he's out driving Hamilton. He uh -oh. really is. The porpoising problem appears to have been addressed now is it completely yeah. soft not sure but red bull is they're rolling man verstappen wins uh he takes the checker flag there at baku sergio perez finishes second so red bull goes one two there in azerbaijan and i actually watched um a lot of the practice rounds how about that it's fun those cars yeah. go fast it's good it's fun my nephew's big into it my sister got uh, got him some tickets to the one coming up in Austin. Those those tickets, I assume, are not cheap. So that is that's great. But 
Verstappen now a 21 point lead in the driver's standings Ooh. after a rough start to the season. Ferrari just they're they're in a slide, man. Now down 80 points to Red Bull in the team standings. Just got to finish some races in the red cars, boys. I I mean, come on, what are we doing? I thought this was I thought Ferrari it seemed like start of the season like they were really going to challenge Red Bull, but starting to feel like Red Bull's pulling away, man. Yeah, I you got to be sweating. I'll be interested to uh, to see how it goes behind the scenes with their crew chief. What's going on with these cars? Let's go. Was 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 it Leclerc like two weeks ago when we were doing it? That was was it on the last lap? Whenever he was going, no, <laughs> no, no, <laughs> no. <laughs> yes, that was him. Uh, that was him. Oh, that's great. But yeah, he is. Uh, he is very, very frustrated currently. He had to, he had finished two out of the last three races. Like the car is just blown up on him. <laughs> like he, Brutal. Yeah. Out of his control, man. That's that sport. It's it's a fascinating sport. All right. On that note, episode 222 in the books. We covered a lot of ground. On yes, this we one. Did. Boy, yes, we did. We'll have a new podcast that'll drop Thursday morning. Just a reminder. You can hear Teddy from 3 to 6 on 94.7 The Ref. You can hear me on SiriusXM Big 12 Radio, Channel 375. Hope you all have a great week. Until next time, we appreciate you all for listening. And do what you always do, Oklahoma. Take care of each other.